Coming to you from the West Coast, this is Politicoast. Today is October 6th, 2016, and you're listening to Episode 2. Politicoast is the podcast that explores what is happening in British Columbia and around the country. I'm Ian. And I'm Scott. And if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you found this podcast. And of course, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, where we're at Politicoast Pod. Today, we're going to get into the Trudeau government's new carbon pricing plan and a few other random things. But first, we've had some feedback because apparently people actually listen to us, or at least they've spotted us. Yeah, we saw a tweet last week asking, is this new podcast funded by someone? It's time in and apparent marketing budget are suspicious. Which is hilarious because the budget, as I tweeted back, has so far been about $25 that I've just sort of put out of pocket to A, buy a domain, and B, promote a Facebook ad. You, you really got to wonder, if if $10 of Facebook ads is suspicious, you know, what isn't? What it really is to me is a really like good pat on my back for making our logo, which is most obviously a ripoff of the government of BC's logo, as someone else pointed out, but it looks damn good, and I'm pretty proud of it. It also means I apparently can make a website and look like a professional. But of course, if you really want to know the backstory of us, at least at some basic level, we talked about that in episode one. We also had some more positive feedback, some people starting to engage with us on Twitter and Facebook, and I want to see more of that. I want to know what people actually want to hear us say. I've had a blog online for some form or another for actually over 15 years. I set up my first website back in high school on GeoCities when you had to code it by hand, and then through WordPress and writing for student newspapers, and even up to sort of pitching this idea for this podcast, I never really produce these materials for an audience. I just do these kind of things for myself. It was a way to organize my thoughts and get the ideas that I have about politics and about the world just out there. That's not to say what I write tends to be obscure or unread. Some of those posts on my blog did get a modest bit of traffic, but still, it's a sign of the sort of attention we get in the first week, and let's not be, you know, overly boasting we've had 150 listens which is almost nothing but i think the sort of interest in it that suspicion is just a sign of how underserved the canadian political podcast market is yeah if one podcast showing up suspicious that really gives a sign the the market's pretty empty and there's uh, definitely a niche to fill yeah i don't want to be the only one doing this other than cbc or mclean's and they do good podcasts but Hopefully we'll start to see more. This apparently doesn't take much to get going, and you can do it while you drink, like we're doing. But actually, we're kind of going in the opposite direction, because last week, the bad news was that the strategist decided to release almost the most average strategist episode ever. Like, it wasn't bad, it was good and enjoyable, but then at the end, they just go, and this is the final episode, period. Close up doors. Way out of left field. Yeah, surprised everyone. Everyone, I think, still kind of thinks it's a joke. Except Corey Hogan, one of the hosts, has now gone on to work for the government, and that's a pretty good sign you can't do a political podcast snarking at the government every week. So there goes our best competition. Yeah, I guess that means we're probably the largest Western Canada podcast in the politics category, but only by default. There you go. So get out there and tell your friends about us. Moving into our first segment, Green Shift 2, Shift Harder, Shift Softer. Let's talk about Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's carbon pricing announcement. Okay, this week, uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced the federal government was going to require the provinces to introduce a carbon price. Starting in 2018, there will be a requirement that all provinces will have a $10 a ton carbon price raised into $50 a ton by 2020. That's a $10 per year ratcheting upwards. For comparison, BC's carbon tax has been stuck at $30 for several years now. I was first brought in in 2008 at $10 a ton and then raised by $5 a year till it hit its current level. So this means that we won't see anything here in BC changing until 2021 at the earliest, unless the government decides to make some moves. They, before they've said it's they're not going to do anything until the other provinces catch up, whether that means introduce a price at all or hit $30, we'll have to see. Yeah, I mean, reaction to this announcement's been pretty swift and sharply divided. It's obviously, I guess, good news for Christy Clark since she doesn't have to do anything and gets applauded as a leader again on this front. But what was weird to me was just the way Trudeau made the announcement. He made the announcement while provincial environment ministers 
were in a meeting trying to hash out what their coordinated strategy would be. It's kind of like getting a group of people together and saying, all right, we're going to come up with a group plan. And then someone's off in the corner telling you what the plan is. It obviously offended them. And some of them just stormed right out of the meeting. Just not a good sign for provincial relationships. I mean, I've heard a few people say it's still better than Harper, who wouldn't have had that meeting in the first place. But it's not a good start for this new climate plan. It's definitely following the approach the previous government took of simply setting the federal policy and letting the chips fall where they may. Uh, Was it last week they announced they're going to be keeping the same uh, growth rate set by the previous government without a first minister's meeting on health care? Yeah. I mean, this climate question is such a, it should be a much easier win for Trudeau. You have BC, Alberta, and Ontario, and Quebec, I believe, already with carbon pricing or coming in. And so these should be your strongest allies. But the next day after the announcement, Rachel Notley turns around and says she's not buying into the plan unless she gets pipelines approved, which he could have arranged that before, whether or not you support the pipelines, at least that's a way to negotiate, to do some diplomacy. But it seems like he sort of got this idea in his head that this is the way he's going to do it. And he just sort of went for it. I mean, this is exactly what we saw, I think, in the spring when the assisted dying debate over Bill C-14 was going on. I lobbied hard on that because full disclosure, as we're giving now, I work for the BC Humanist Association. We lobbied for very permissive assisted dying legislation. The Joint Parliamentary Committee made some very strong and progressive recommendations, many of which the government just chose to ignore and bring in words like reasonably foreseeable natural death that no one had heard before, and then nothing could turn them off that page. It's almost a sort of weird stubbornness that we're discovering in Trudeau. Yeah, though, is it really that surprising? They're a majority government, they're governing like a majority government does. It's pretty common for once a government like that gets an idea on how they want to proceed usually takes a fair bit of public outcry to shift them off message on that and and change their direction. And the assisted dying, there just wasn't that change. I think they landed where a lot of Canadians felt fairly comfortable uh, with, and there just wasn't that pressure mounted among the general public. I don't know. I think maybe the bigger issue for me is just how they roll out these decisions Obviously, every majority government's going to abuse its powers to the majority it can get away with, but you don't usually make such a mess of it. You don't, you know, make the announcement about what way you're taking during the negotiations. You don't sort of have a committee recommend something where you have a majority and then disregard big chunks of that committee. It's odd, to to say the least, especially because this government's made a huge emphasis on consulting, and in fact, they've drawing a fair bit of flack for consulting and consulting and not actually implementing the policies they ran on. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see where they go from here with carbon pricing. You linked to a Nanos poll recently that I think showed there was a potential for public buy-in, I would say, for carbon pricing. At least that's how I read it, as people support the idea of taking action. They support the idea of a national strategy. Yeah, there's definitely a majority of people in favor of carbon pricing. There is strong support for climate change initiatives. There's support here for the federal government putting a national plan in place. Yes, okay. You would sort of assume there would be buy-in for that. I think that's what people would want to see. Having a national plan to reach targets, there's 77% support. And I mean, there's no province or region that opposes having national plan. Yes. Because I guess that's the most reasonable thing. No one disagrees with national plans that you just assume everyone gets along with. Well, we will see some disagreement on whether plans should necessarily be done at national levels or other levels of government. But uh, I think in terms of climate change, there's definitely a interest in with a national plan rather than the piecemeal approach that's been taken all over the place so far. And that's one of the lingering questions on this is how do the various systems interlock? Uh, We have a carbon price, as we discussed earlier, but Ontario and Quebec have cap and trade. And Alberta's carbon price uh, is structured somewhat differently than ours. And how all those systems work together and how a company that does business across several provinces has to deal with those various regulations and pricing or how that's going to work is still an open question. 
and I think probably one where you see a fair bit of friction in the coming days. Well, and then you have provinces like Nova Scotia who have cut their emissions partially through regulations and efforts they've put in, partially through a bad economy that means no factories are running. But they're understandably frustrated by this idea that they have to now tax the little carbon they are producing. And I don't know what the answer to that is. Well, if they've already cut their emissions, they're not going to be paying much carbon tax anyway. That's a theory. I guess they're worried about the little industry they have left. I guess it's the difference between the sort of equal versus the more equitable approach. Do we put just a flat tax across the country that's the same for everyone, or do we put a higher tax where the emissions are worse? I can't imagine that would be popular in Alberta or BC, though, where we're pretty bad. And not to mention, I can't really see a a rationale for doing it that way, because if one place is outputting more carbon, they're going to pay more just on flat tax anyway. That's the goal. It doesn't really matter if a ton of CO2 gets emitted on one side of a provincial boundary or another. The effect's the same. Yeah, and I mean, that sort of leads into the next question that I've heard a lot of the environmentalists really bring into this is, this tax is nowhere near enough. I mean, environmental defense, I heard the other day quoting maybe 100 or $200 a ton, and that's you know maybe not palatable to many industries or provinces. But the point of this isn't to just generate revenue to put to green industry. It's to stop people from polluting. So you actually want a disincentive to pollute, which means you do want a pretty high tax. The initial problem with sin taxes on, say, cigarettes and alcohol is they're not high enough to make people stop. Yes, I, I agree. And I, I don't necessarily see why they felt the need to cap it at $50 a ton after five years. It seems much better just if we're eventually going to have to hit the $100 or $200 mark, put it out in the future, let it uh, be a couple decades away, let people make investment decisions in the long term based off that, because now they have some certainty on where it's going to be in the future. But at least that way, people can start planning and, and from a purely political calculus, it becomes the future government's problem. I frankly think they could have gone even farther than that. They're only starting at $10 in two years. They could have started at $40 in two years. Because no matter what announcement he made, he was going to piss off Brad Wall. Brad Wall was not going to like any carbon price because I'm pretty sure the man doesn't believe in climate change. So this is another one where he seems to be, where Trudeau seems to be trying to do the very liberal thing of making everyone happy, but leaving everyone pissed off. And you got to go, who's he hoping to appease in the long run with this? He's going to lose the environmentalists. He's going to lose the industry if he doesn't. He's got to find a way to... Yeah, well, right now I think it's a decent split down the middle on that front. And it's definitely an argument that the price isn't high enough, but you've at least created the space for future maneuverability on the issue in a couple of years. And it, it's not going to be till the second term where we hit that cap. So at that point, uh, there's definitely time to adjust things accordingly, especially uh, with respect to how close we are to our targets. The final thing I have for this is just from the BC angle, this is a very straightforward win for Christy Clark. I mean, she doesn't have to do anything. And a win, and by a win, I mean just that. She doesn't have to do anything. She doesn't have to take a political risk. She doesn't get stuck with having to raise the price of carbon. She can just sit on it and feel like she's done her duty, even though it was Gordon Campbell who put it in place and got it to where it was. She's just kind of flattened it off and ignored her own climate leadership panel, which she set up to advise her. Maybe the question will be, if the NDP wins, what will they do with these targets? Will they sort of keep the same flat level, or will they get more ambitious and try to really jump up there and, you know, take that place as a leader in the country. We'll have to see, because I don't think the NDP's announced their climate policy, have they? Not to my knowledge. We'll have to keep our ears open for that. Well, we've discussed the provincial government's response. What about the opposition in Ottawa? Well, the Conservatives call everything that the Liberals do a tax, and is there anything more to say to it than that, that it's a tax on everything? It's a tax. Even yeah, well, that's the thing that noise the crap out of me about the uh, Conservative Party on this one is uh, you can't get a more market-friendly approach to solving the problem than this. I mean, this is literally using markets to solve problems, which should be, in theory, the Conservatives' whole point of view on this. I mean, I get 2008, you're running against a opposition leader that's using this as their main policy and can't endorse your opponent's policy, but, you know, it's been eight years since then, it's time to come around on it, because this is a once-in-a-generation opportunity to make the case for markets, and the Conservatives are just seeding the high ground on this. So you're blaming it all on Stefan Dion? 
Am I getting that clear? Is it his fault for pushing the green shift so poorly? No. Well, he, he did do a horrible job of marketing in it, but that's another point. My point is the conservatives, once the initial threat from having to deal with Stefan Dion in the election subsided, they kind of didn't reevaluate and bring their thinking more in line with where, in theory, they should be on the issue. Yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see how... I mean, they have their sort of caucus approach, which Ron Ambrose has put forward the sort of keep attacking everything the liberals do as attacks, whether which, it is or not. As an interim leader, it's about all you can really do, because you can't really be set new policy at that exactly. point. Exactly, so it's kind of up to the leadership candidates to take a different position should they choose to. And I don't think we've seen that yet. Michael Chong has a different position, but I don't know that he's managed to leverage this issue. Yes, I, I did see him weigh in briefly on it, but it was mostly just to say it's not revenue neutral enough going forward in that the provinces could still keep the taxes and not refund them when they uh, implement their own policies. Which is all the flexibility that Justin Trudeau is trying to give them. Yes, but uh, I mean, his point is that, it's that you need to have a revenue neutral tax. So that's his main point of attack. And every other uh, candidate that I've seen address this or carbon pricing in general is just flat out against it. And the NDP? So I heard a panel with Linda Duncan and the environment critic from the Conservatives and the environment minister. And she definitely, in a way, applauded the plan as finally doing something. But she took that, this doesn't go far enough. Why is this only happening in two years? Why isn't this going farther? This isn't going to help us meet the Paris agreements that the government just ratified today. Why is the government still sticking with the sort of Harper targets for climate reduction? It wasn't a very strong attack, and I don't know that they have a strong attack on this other than to say, go farther. And then you have Elizabeth May who can scream in the corner, go even farther than that. But that's as far as I think the NDP and Greens have really taken this issue. Yeah, okay, well, yeah. I suppose the only other question is, what's the uh, long-term political fets of this going to be? Uh, what does it mean for uh, 2017 here and 2019 nationally? I think the short-term question is going to come around back to what Rachel Notley's brought up of she'll only buy in if there's pipelines coming. And the first one of those to come up is going to be Kinder Morgan here in BC. And so you now have this sort of three-way calculus between Christy Clark, who set out her infamous five requirements for any pipeline to be built through BC, Alberta, who wants to get oil sands oil to market, and the federal government, who is stuck in the middle and is also trying to meet climate agreements. I saw one report that suggests Trudeau is definitely strongly in favor of getting a pipeline through BC, even if it costs him a few seats. And that's a calculus he's trying to make. You know, does he piss off a few more environmentalists in BC to try to win a few seats in Alberta or Saskatchewan or even hold on to the ones he got? And it's tough to say. And all of that's based on first past the post, which in theory will be gone in the next election if he can keep that promise. We'll have to see. At the rate it's going, it's going to be a little questionable whether it's going to be ready in time, whatever system they come up with to roll out for 2019. So in the short term, I guess it comes down to the pipeline politics again, as we're going to have to keep coming back to until we're utterly sick of it. And I guess beyond that, the price doesn't actually come into effect until it's just about time for the next federal election, at which point there'll be numerous provincial elections, which this will have to come up. And two years is a long time. It could be scrapped in that time. It could I can't see it going up. I think the floor he set this week is the highest that he can now set it. You can't go, oh yeah, that thing I said two years ago, actually I should have gone $30 starting and then rising to 100 in five years. No, it's then you look like you're really digging into people's pockets. So maybe he's just screwed the world and damned us all to global warming. Yeah, well, he's moving fast in a lot of countries, so probably won't be him that'll bear the blame on that one. But it does bring up an interesting question on uh, the timing of this. Two years out does put it pretty close to the next election. And uh, you got to wonder uh, what the thinking on that was. I guess what you can do then, though, is going into an election, you can say, look, we are the government that brought in a price on carbon, like we said we would. And we did it collaboratively with the province, even though we had to make them do it. It's a way to sort of say, check, I hit that campaign promise, even if it was fudged a little bit and a little bit late, which is better than some of the other promises that are just flat out broken or ignored. 
Okay, moving on. You went to David Eby's uh, nomination meeting this week? Yeah, on Sunday evening, local BC NDP MLA David Eby had his nomination meeting, which is usually a fairly bureaucratic, just kind of procedural meeting. But this was more of a pre-election rally because he's the sort of star of the BC NDP, even more so than John Horgan, who leads the party. And it was interesting because John Horgan was there. And we had Melanie Mark, who's another fairly prominent BC NDP MLA who won a by-election recently and became the first First Nations woman to be elected to the legislature. And another MLA, George Heyman, was also there. So you had this sort of like stars of the BC NDP coming to this one little meeting in Kitsilano. And it was held at Kitts House, which holds about 150 people, and it was packed. Like, it was full to the rafters. And John Horgan gave a little bit of a speech, and he gave us a little glimpse at what the BC NDP platform will be. There's nothing too surprising in there. Childcare. Enacting the UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous People and some of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission recommendations. You know, cutting corporate union donations, the usual stuff. Yeah, nothing really unsurprising there, other than that they're probably going to make David Eby one of the star uh, people going out through the uh, upcoming campaign. Not even really surprising on that one. Yeah, and I mean, they obviously hope to make him a cabinet minister, and I think there were rumors going around that he might have tried for the leadership in the last round after Adrian Dick stepped down, but he was a very young two-year-old child who was adorable and running around this campaign meeting. But honestly, from where I sat, which was about the second row... Horgan gave a good speech. Like, it was a campaign rally, so it was very raw, raw NDP, boo, boo, Christy Clark. But he was more enthusiastic than when I saw him campaigning for leader against Adrian Dix, when I thought he was sort of the milk toast middle of the road, not too bad, not too great guy. And so it'll be interesting to see if he can sort of keep up the energy and build a positive campaign while also still being able to bring forward a critique of the BC Liberals. Because I think that's one thing that really bit Adrian Dix is they had this idea they were going to run a purely positive campaign. And I think even Tom Mulcair tried to do this in the last federal election. He was going to run a purely positive campaign. You saw creepy, smiley Tom in the debates (laughs) that no one knew and no one trusted. Whereas if he'd sort of stuck to his House of Commons grilling the prime minister, you know, debating style, it would have been rougher, but people might have liked it. Oh, and, uh, yeah, he, he massively misread the mood of the country on that one. It was a change election, and anybody who wasn't going to be making the solid case, the um, you know passionate, emotional case for change, wasn't going to win. Yeah, and I mean, Mulcair's massively misread the mood of a lot of things since the election, but he's still around, and some people really want him to stay, which is strange, but maybe we'll get into that in another episode. Uh, the other news that we saw this week, is there's going to be no fall legislative sitting, which kind of sucks because... What are we going to talk about? Exactly. We only really had the one major story this week. So I blame Christy Clark for trying to ruin our podcast. But more seriously, to me, it's sort of a lack of legislative ambition. It's almost like saying there's nothing actually that needs to be done in BC. Like the province is doing okay. The bureaucrats can run it for the next six months. Well, that's more or less uh, being Christy Clark's approach all along is make a few minor tweets here and there, the occasional policy announcement, but more or less be a modestly competent manager more than a leader. I mean, she has talked about how much she hates Victoria, which is always weird to me. I always kind of like it there. It's a nice city, but maybe inside the... It's not the most amusing place to grow up. Maybe inside the legislative bubble is terrible. Who knows? Uh, Who'd want to be sitting across from the inner harbor there? That's just horrible. (laughs) The one thing I do want to call out, though, is there's a lot of people who complain when these kind of announcements come out that MLA shouldn't get paid if they don't go to the legislature or MPs shouldn't get paid if they don't go to the House of Commons. And it's just such a fundamental misunderstanding of what the job of an elected official is. The line of attack that Jack Layton used in the one debate where he called out Michael Ignatieff's terrible attendance record really worked because people buy into this idea. But more realistically, the job of these elective officials is more than just being there for the debates and being there for the votes. It's being in your constituency, lobbying for your individuals, working in committees, all these other things that you don't see or hear on the day-to-day news, but matter. And so, to me, they shouldn't lose their money, but they should still also be accountable in the legislature and giving us stuff to talk about. 
I guess it's almost strange. The only place I managed to see this story was in business in Vancouver. Perhaps it's like you're saying, it's such a cliche by now that it's not actually news that Christy Clark has cancelled another session of the legislature. It's just what happens. So it's not something the Vancouver Sun needs to pick up. It's just, oh, it would be news if they were going to the legislature and having sessions, I guess. Yeah, well, they've been in power since 2001. Something like that. So I, at this point, I guess they fresh ran out of ideas. Well, let's turn our attention a bit more locally to here in Vancouver. We came across this story about the Vancouver School Board, and I don't think either of us really knows what to make of it, and we'll probably put our foot in our mouth if we go too far into it. The basic facts, as I understand them, is WorkSafe BC is investigating the school board as it sounds like the entire senior staff has gone on stress leave, citing a bullying culture and a toxic workplace environment. Meanwhile, the minister is trying to investigate this, Mike Bernier, and is threatening to fire the entire school board, which is a Vision Vancouver dominated. And of course, all the trustees deny that they bully the senior staff, and the senior staff aren't going to be talking about who's bullying them, because if you've ever been in a shitty workplace environment, there's nothing you really want to do less than talk about it, even though you might have to. But at the same time, this school board has decided not to proceed with the school closures that they planned. The management and the staff had come up with a list of schools that would have to close if the Vancouver School Board was going to meet the balanced budget that it has to, as set by the provincial government. But it said, all right, no, we're not going to do this. We're going to scrap all that work you've done. And that probably didn't make people feel good about their job. But I can't imagine as well that trying to come up with a list of schools to close makes you feel good about your job either. So I almost wonder how much of the fiscal constraint of the public school system isn't the you know primary cause, but it might exacerbate or make worse this sort of stress that everyone's under. I don't actually have any answers or even really more questions about this. I just, it sounds like it sucks for everyone. Yeah, so it's definitely something we're going to have to keep an eye on going forward. Yeah, and hopefully it doesn't end with the whole school board getting fired, because that'll be a mess. The next story we saw is Councillor Jeff Meggs on the Vision Vancouver-dominated city council wants to increase the taxes on property developments as a way to get a bit more money for the city, I guess. Basically, the idea is when a developer goes to start a new development, they have to pay a certain levy to the city, and he thinks that could go up a little bit. And more interestingly, he doesn't think that would have any effect on the housing prices, because in his mind, as I understand it, developers would just eat that cost and they wouldn't pass it right on to the people buying the houses. Which is absurd, because costs aren't borne by the people who necessarily cut the check. They're born with the least flexible party in any given arrangement, and in this housing market, that's not the person selling that property. Well, and to me, the bigger problem with this whole idea isn't that costs won't get passed down, it's that the cost might stop another development. I mean, we were talking last week about the need for more supply in the city of Vancouver, but this is like an extra roadblock rather than open door. Yes, we we talked a fair bit last week about zoning and the ways that limits supply and drives up prices, but the approval process and the fees that go with it are another one. Literally driving up the costs of developing. Yes, this isn't a hidden cost. This isn't its the way um, regulatory controls about land use and whatnot are. This is an explicit dollar value cost that gets paid. And, of course, that's going to get passed on to the consumer. I yeah, mean, not, not only that, it, it can take, you know, we're talking months or sometimes even years to get processes approved, um, projects uh, to go forward from conception to the time they first break ground. And that is additional costs that get added onto it then. The developers are paying people to push those through, process them, and that's time their crews and their equipment aren't actually working and making them money. And all those costs get baked into the final cost of the project. But you can't even say that this tax would be a job creation tax, as in create jobs for more pencil pushers, because it would just be an extra fee. So I don't know if Jeff Meggs isn't selling it well, but it doesn't really make any sense to me. Yeah, it's a very odd position to take, especially in a city where if they're having a revenue problem, 
Vancouver has an extremely low mill rate on their property taxes compared to the rest of the country, and the obvious solution would be to up the property tax a bit, or, you know, let more developments go forward and reap the increased property taxes that way. All right. Well, speaking of Vancouver City Hall, do you want to talk about flags today? Of course I want to talk about flags. Okay, this week in flag news, this past weekend, uh, the city of Vancouver held a uh, celebration to mark the uh, 67th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. And among the things they did was raise the uh, flag of the People's Republic at uh, City Hall. And that drew a fair bit of uh, concern and uh, criticism from various residents. This is a weird little fascination I have of local politics, is the idea of the ceremonial recognitions. My favorite story is out of Kelowna with how they took what's otherwise the most mundane bit of municipal politics, the proclamation, and made it an ongoing scandal year after year by just politicizing the hell out of it. For a number of years, they had one mayor. He would categorically refuse to issue any proclamations for Pride Week. He opposed gay marriage and said, no, he would never recognize that. But he would, meanwhile, approve protect human life and anti-choice proclamations. Eventually, someone took him to the Human Rights Tribunal, won, and he was told by the Human Rights Tribunal to be fair in issuing proclamations. His response was to stop doing proclamations. A few years later, he lost election. Someone else came in. They started doing proclamations for everyone. That person, I believe, eventually lost. This guy came back, (laughs) wouldn't do any proclamations. And then, finally, Kelowna's new mayor, Colin Bazran, I believe, will do all the gay proclamations. He also approved a rainbow sidewalk. He got nicknamed Sugar Plum, and it's a kind of name he chose to wear with pride, and he launched the Sugar Plum Ball, which he used to raise money for the Okanagan Pride Society. It's amazing because it doesn't matter. These proclamations are a way for nonprofits, and I've been with multiple nonprofits that have used proclamations to try to get attention for an issue. And when they're approved, no one notices unless the nonprofit itself makes a bunch of noise out of it or the city screws up. Uh, a great example of this was with the BC Humanist Association in the last couple of weeks. The city of Victoria, we had asked them to proclaim International Blasphemy Rights Day. The city debated it, which instantly made it controversial, which instantly made it newsworthy, which was fantastic for us because we got to book press releases and do interviews and take what otherwise no one would have paid attention to and make it a story and get our word out. And so the Chinese flag, to bring it back, these proclamations and flags are the sort of controversies that municipalities can just bring on themselves by approving the flag or not approving the flag. They might not have had a win, but you just got to be way more consistent. Yeah, this is definitely an interesting one, and I can certainly understand where the controversy arises. Even aside, I mean, this lingering dislike of communism from the Cold War, but not only that, the communist regime in China is definitely a authoritarian and totalitarian one, and which is at odds with uh, Canadian values, and I think in the non-controversial sense, which, you know, we've had some controversy around that, but... I think this is one of those everybody can agree on ones. Uh, So that's, I I can see why somebody wouldn't, or would take umbrage with that. Yeah, authoritarian, totalitarian, racked up one of, you know, history's worst death tolls. So you can definitely understand why people wouldn't want to be seen honoring that regime. Maybe rejecting this proposal would have upset the Chinese or would have upset whatever community lobbied for it here in Vancouver or asked for it. That's what I mean by lobbied, like literally filled out a form. And they didn't want to make that a controversy, but you definitely invite a controversy. It it almost makes me think like municipal governments would just be better off getting rid of all of these yes, ceremonies this, that just ask for controversy. Yes, this was entirely avoidable. And I'm surprised they didn't see this coming because there's a lot of uh, immigrants here who've fled China or fled Hong Kong prior to the uh, transfer to China. It's not a small uh, community here, and quite reasonably, they're 
they when they you know fled that country they're going to be a little peeved when uh their newfound home is seen as uh endorsing that and that has been politicos make sure to subscribe on itunes or wherever you listen to podcasts and follow us on facebook and twitter at politicos pod leave us a review and let us know what you think really tell us how to make this show better thanks for listening that'll be a total gong show i'm not going to use that Way too forced. It's it's a trumped up trickle down moment, and we don't want that. I can use that.